hey, no art, all over here. It's quite weird that office chairs come back up again because there's no coil springs inside or anything like that. When you pull the lever to go down, you're opening a valve to release some gas. And you can do this over and over and over and over again without ever running out of gas. So obviously the gas goes back in somehow when it goes up. But how does it go up? I mean, the gas isn't pushing itself back in, or is it? Well, let's cut one open and take a look inside because it's absolutely brilliant and mechanically speaking, surprisingly simple. Before you cut into anything like this, you have to depressurize it. And if you expect to find a spring inside, just don't do it. Springs will mess you up. All right, so what do we see? Well, the first thing that stands out is that what looks like the cylinder is actually just an empty shell. It holds no pressure and just keeps the actual cylinder upright, which looks like the piston rod. But the rod is actually down there and it rests on a very simple pressure bearing. This is actually what keeps all your weight up. And it's just two hardened steel washers with some bearing balls held in between with a piece of plastic. Anyway, inside the real cylinder, we have an outer and an inner sleeve. We have the piston and the valve that is operated by this orange piece of plastic that is in turn, of course, operated by the handle of the chair. Let's see how it works. There are two chambers, one above the piston and another one below it, which is always open to the outer sleeve. Look, there are just some holes on this bottom piece of plastic. These holes also go down to a weirdly shaped rubber ring that is fixed to a metal washer. I'm not entirely sure what that's about. Anyway, these two chambers are connected at the top with a bidirectional valve. You can open it with the handle connecting the two chambers, so the gas never actually leaves the cylinder. You just release it from one chamber into the other. When you sit on the chair, it compresses the gas in chamber one and the gas in chamber two expands. Your weight will determine how big the difference in pressure needs to be to find an equilibrium. When you open the valve, you let some of the compressed gas flow into chamber two and soon you'll find an equilibrium a little bit lower. Now, the smart part is that if you lift your buttocks off the chair and open the valve, it goes up. And that's strange, because if you open the valve, the pressure will equalize, right? The pressure in chamber one and two will become the same, because as long as the valve is open, it's just one big chamber. And you would be forgiven to think that this means that there is no net force on the piston. However, the surface area of the piston is not the same on each side. On one side, there is the full area of the piston to push against, while on the other side, only part of the piston is exposed to the high-pressure gas inside the cylinder, while another part of it is taken up by the piston rod, which is exposed to just one atmosphere of pressure on the outside of the cylinder. And that's the key principle at play here. When the valve is open, these push against each other and cancel each other out. But the middle is just pushing against the air around us, which has a much lower pressure. So when you open the valve, the piston extends, unless you sit on it, of course. In that case, your weight creates enough extra pressure to overcome that of the gas inside. Some time ago, I made a short talking about this effect in hydraulic cylinders and how they can extend with more force than they can retract. And many people commented asking if we couldn't just give one side of the piston ripples, for example, to increase the surface area. But sadly, that doesn't work because it's not actually about surface area, even though I used that word. Especially in shorts, I sometimes choose clarity over technically correct terms. In this case, it's actually about the project projected area, which is basically the size of the shadow a shape would cast from a light source that's infinitely far away. At least if it doesn't have any bends in it and blah blah blah. So ripples or hollowing out the rod or something like that will not work. It all comes down to the size of this opening projected onto the piston. And this relation between the diameter of the cylinder and the diameter of the rod is also what determines its spring curve. Most springs, like coil springs, try to have a linear spring rate. One distance takes one force, two distances take two force. So it becomes harder and harder. That's very nice for holding up weight that's subject to change in a dynamic environment, like a car that can hold between one and five people that might drive fast or slow over big or small bumps. But 
Sometimes you want to have a constant force over the whole range of travel. For the trunk of a car, for example. You don't want it to slam in your face when you open it. Well, it needs Viagra to actually get it up all the way. No, in this case, you want a constant force spring. This beautiful thing is just a sealed cylinder with a rod very similar to the cylinder from the office chair, but without the valve. The chambers on both sides of the piston are permanently connected. The piston is basically just a spacer because it got holes going through it to equalize the pressure on both sides. Sometimes it's a slot on the side of the cylinder wall instead, as this old Tony shows in his amazing video on constant force gas springs. The size of the holes, slot or valve in relation to the viscosity of the fluid inside of the cylinder determines the speed at which it can move. Here they did something really clever. Instead of just the right amount of oil needed for lubrication, they filled a few centimeters of the cylinder with oil. And when the piston reaches the end, it encounters the oil, which is of course much more viscous than the nitrogen gas. And therefore, it goes through the holes much slower. That's how the trunk of your car slows down at the end. Pushing oil through tiny holes is also how a shock absorber works, by the way. Although they are a little bit more complex. They have some magical shim stacks and geometry to make sure that extension is easier than compression and that they do the right amount of damping at different speeds. They generally also keep the nitrogen separated from the oil to prevent bubbles. But I digress. Let's finally explain the spring rate of these gas springs. By changing the size of the rod relative to the size of the cylinder, we can get close to a constant force. When it takes up the whole cylinder, the spring rate is curved upwards. When you halve the volume, you double the pressure. So this is double, this is double, this is double. It goes crazy at the end. But if we zoom in, the start looks pretty flat. That's because the percentage change in volume at the start is pretty small. One centimeter here might just be 5% volume change, while here, all the way down, it might be a 50% volume change. So if we make a gas spring that starts out with a high pressure, and we give it a big volume, but a slim rod, it has a large range of motion for a small percentage change in volume, and thus a small increase in pressure over the length of the stroke. A real-world downside is that a small piston rod also means that you need a high pressure to get it to the desired force you want. And the rod has to be strong enough to withstand that force too. And then there are usually some space constraints on the cylinder volume. So in the real world, we can't really make a constant force gas spring. But it's pretty easy to get close enough for all practical applications. By introducing the valve, the gas spring in your office chair gains some interesting properties. It can change its curve from something like this to something like this by opening the valve. However, this first curve, when it's closed, changes a little bit depending on the height. When you're all the way down, this small distance doubles the pressure, while when it's all the way up, it takes way longer. So your chair is more bouncy at the top. And I believe you can actually feel it, but it's very subtle, so who knows? Because this effect is slightly less extreme than you might expect, because it's closed on both sides. So when it's extended all the way, the pressure in the bottom chamber drops really fast, while when you're all the way down, the pressure in the bottom chamber hardly changes at all. Let's take a close look at the construction of this valve. There are two o-rings around the valve stem, one of which leads to the outside and stays closed as it were. The valve stem has a narrowing that allows air to pass the other o-ring when it is pressed down. The gas then escapes through one of these tiny holes through the bigger piece of plastic into the double wall, which is connected to the other chamber. But in essence, it's just two O-rings and a little piece of metal. And I think that's brilliant. And just like this whole contraption, this piece of metal doesn't even need a spring, because the pressure inside pushes it closed. If you want to learn more about the math behind these types of mechanisms, I can highly recommend the sponsor of this video, Brilliant.org. I've actually been using Brilliant for a little while before we got in contact for this sponsorship to brush up on their maths in a structured way, so I can better make these videos. With Brilliant, you can learn logic, data analysis, computer science, and much, much more. What really makes it stand out, in my opinion, are two things. The first is that it's fun. It's, it's not dry. And secondly, they have very good visuals with their explanation. And I mean, 
I guess you can see in my videos how much these two things align with what I stand for. It's just so much easier to spend time learning when you actually want to. I'm working my way through the math section and I can just feel that they really thought about the right order of things, which means I don't have to think about it, which is often a real problem with online education, in my opinion. So with Brilliant, I can just do my little practice every day and know that I'm heading in the right direction. You can try it all out for free for 30 days if you go to brilliant.org slash nailart and you also get 20% of an annual premium subscription. Such an awesomely strange job I have. I hope to see you in the next video.